Welcome to episode one of Strange Tales in American History. I'm your host, Mr. Beat, and today we are looking at the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. It is fascinating. It's a fascinating topic. It has so many weird twists and turns, so many coincidences. It just seems so ridiculous that it's actually even true when you look at all the details, but it is all true. And we're going to go through it today on the first episode. So, let's go back about 155 years ago to 1865. And Abraham Lincoln is president. He had just worked really hard to pass the 13th Amendment. Really uh, seen well in the movie Lincoln, the Spielberg film. But you saw his final days where he went to different members of Congress getting the 13th Amendment to pass. It was a huge accomplishment. The 13th Amendment, that's the one that ended slavery. The Civil War was winding down, and it was looking like it was going to be a Union victory, and so they were already making plans for, what do we do after this war gets over with? This became to be known as the Reconstruction Era, and... President Abraham Lincoln had his plans already in place for Reconstruction, readmitting the southern states who had left the Union and having a plan to uh, forgive and to allow politicians to come back into government and really just heal the wounds of uh, the United States' worst war in its history, a war that ended up killing between 650,000 and 750,000 Americans. So uh, that was going on at the time. Abraham Lincoln was a very controversial president when he was alive. The entire war, even in the North. In fact, remember, in 1864, he had a lot of people uh, turn against him, and that was a big reason why uh, George McClellan was recruited to run against him in the presidential election of 1864. So with all that in mind, he has enemies in the North, almost just as much as he has enemies in the South, for crying out loud. And so there were constant death threats to President Lincoln. Um, He had dreams about it because of that. There was actually one dream that was written about. I'll read a quote from Abraham Lincoln himself. Uh, He told this dream to his bodyguard, Ward Hill Lamone, Quote, there seemed to be a death-like stillness about me. Then I heard subdued sobs, as if a number of people were weeping. I thought I left my bed and wandered downstairs. There the silence was broken by the same pitiful sobbing, but the mourners were invisible. I went from room to room. No living person was in sight, but the same mournful sounds of distress met me as I passed along. I saw light in all the rooms. Every object was familiar to me. But where were all the people who were grieving as if their hearts would break? I was puzzled and alarmed. What could be the meaning of all this? Determined to find the cause of a state of things so mysterious and so shocking, I kept on until I arrived at the East Room, which I entered. There I met with a sickening surprise. Before me rested a corpse wrapped in funeral vestments. Around it were stationed soldiers who were acting as guards. And there was a throng of people gazing mournfully upon the corpse corpse, whose face was covered, others weeping pitifully. Who is dead in the White House? I demanded of one of the soldiers. The president, was his answer. He was killed by an assassin. Then came a loud burst of grief from the crowd, which woke me from my dream. Unquote. So yeah, there were a lot of Americans who loved Abraham Lincoln, but this dream shows you that he did have lots of enemies. One person who openly hated Lincoln was a young actor named John Wilkes Booth. Booth was basically the Matthew McConaughey of his day. I mean, he was rich and famous. He was an actor who lots of women adored. If you look at pictures of him, it's, you know, pretty obvious. He's a he's an attractive dude. I mean, uh, a lot of people really appreciated his, his uh, acting as well. A serious actor that traveled around in different performances. This is, of course, well before the days of Hollywood. <laughs> film didn't exist yet. But yeah, John Wilkes Booth was a racist, a Southern sympathizer during the Civil War. And of course, he blamed Lincoln for all of the South's troubles. Being rich and famous and all, Booth tended to always be close to important people and events. 
he actually was dating the daughter of John Hale, a senator who was actually, Hale was a huge abolitionist, by the way. But uh, we see in the months and years, you know, before uh, the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, John Wilkes Booth is is at a lot of really important events. In 1859, uh, Booth was an eyewitness to the execution of John Brown, even standing near the scaffold with other armed men to guard against any attempt to rescue Brown. On November 9th, 1863, President Lincoln actually watched John Wilkes Booth perform in the role of the villain Raphael in the play The Marble Heart, which uh, was at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C., the exact place where later, you know, where the assassination took place. And then there's a picture of Lincoln giving his second inaugural address in March of 1865. You can see this picture online. You see Lincoln, and then less than 100 feet away from Lincoln is... John Wilkes Booth. One other weird coincidence is John Wilkes Booth's brother saved the life of Lincoln's oldest son, Robert Todd Lincoln. So that's pretty crazy. Anyway, back to John Wilkes Booth. He, at first, wanted to just kidnap the president and maybe some other politicians. So uh, there originally was not a plan in place to assassinate President Lincoln by John Wilkes Booth. Booth did recruit some of his friends to help. A guy named Samuel Arnold, another guy named George Atzerodt, another one named David Harold, another Michael O'Laughlin, and another Lewis Powell, who was also known by the name of Lewis Payne. And then finally, John Surratt. All of these guys were involved with the conspiracy. And John Surratt's mother, Mary, actually allowed Booth to meet with his co-conspirators at her boarding house in Washington, D.C. So like I said, the original plan was to kidnap Lincoln, take him to Richmond, Virginia, the Confederate capital, and there hold him hostage in return for Confederate prisoners of war. So it was a war strategy, as the Confederates were desperately short of quality soldiers at that stage in the war. On March 17, 1865, the group planned to kidnap President Lincoln while he watched to play at a hospital located on the outskirts of Washington, D.C. However, Lincoln changed his plans at the last minute, and the plot failed. Plans did change. So three weeks later is the end of the Civil War. General Robert E. Lee surrenders to General Ulysses S. Grant at Appomattox. The American Civil War officially came to an end, so Booth figures he needs new plans. Two days later, Lincoln spoke from the White House to a crowd gathered outside. Again, Booth was there, of course. During the speech, Lincoln suggested that voting rights be granted to certain blacks. And this made Booth even angrier at Lincoln. And with the war over, and now Lincoln calling for more rights for people of color, Booth was like, we're going to assassinate Lincoln. He's quoted as saying, that is the last speech he will ever give. On April 14th, Booth stopped by Ford's Theater, which he already knew well, of course. He went there to pick up his mail. And while he was there, he learned of Lincoln's plans to attend that evening's performance of Our American Cousin. Booth determined that this was his perfect opportunity. Like I said, he knew the theater's layout. He had performed there many times. This was it. That afternoon, Booth also went to Mary Surratt's boarding house in D.C. and asked her to take a package to her tavern in Surrattsville, Maryland. He also asked Surratt to have guns and ammunition that Booth had previously stored at the tavern ready to be picked up later that evening. And, of course, Booth called another meeting, a final meeting with his co-conspirators. And at that meeting, Booth said he would kill Lincoln while he watched the play that night. He also planned on stabbing General Ulysses Grant because he was expected to go to the play as well. Later, we find out that Grant had declined the invitation to go to the play as Mary Todd, uh, Abraham Lincoln's wife, and Julia Grant, Grant's wife, didn't get along, so that's why the Grants didn't go. Booth also gave orders for George Atzerodt to kill Vice President Andrew Johnson 
at the Kirkwood house. Because remember, if the president dies, the vice president takes over. And Booth hated Johnson just as much as Lincoln. So Johnson would be at the Kirkwood house, a five-star hotel. He'd be staying there. Atzerodt was to show up. But Atzerodt was having second thoughts. He had never wanted to kill anybody, let alone the vice president, and only had signed up for a kidnapping. Booth pretty much was like, there's no turning back now. You're too far in. You've got to do it, and forced Atzerodt to do it, to go there. Booth also pretty much pressured Lewis Powell to kill Secretary of State William Seward at his home. Seward, of course, was a uh, leading ally of Abraham Lincoln in his cabinet, and Booth hated him as well. So David Harold would join Lewis Powell in killing Secretary of State William Seward at his home. Harold would be the guide to help Powell get to the Seward house and then out of Washington, D.C. later to meet with Booth in Maryland. All the attacks were supposed to happen at the exact same time, which was just after 10 o'clock that night. So, going ahead to that night, they all go to their, their places. First of all, let's look at George Atzerodt. Well, he went to the bar of the Kirkwood house but he could not work up the courage to kill Andrew Johnson, so he just sat around and drank. While getting drunk at the bar, he also may have accidentally said too much, asking the bartender where Johnson was, for example. Azeroth never even attempted to assassinate Johnson. Uh, he basically never left the bar. He did leave behind evidence that he was thinking about it by saying too much, basically, at that bar. At the same time, Lewis Powell enter the home of Secretary of State William Seward. He drew out a knife and ended up in a struggle with many of Seward's friends and family, but he did make his way up to William Seward's bedroom, which that's where Seward was lying. Actually, Seward was recovering from injuries from a carriage accident a few days before, so Seward was already injured. He was already sitting in the bed, injured, recovering. And so this should have been pretty easy for Powell to, to do. Uh, Powell did manage to, uh, to slice up Seward in the head quite a bit, quite savagely, actually. He ended up uh, slicing part of his throat. But, crazy enough, what saved Seward's life was Seward was wearing a metal and canvas splint on his jaw, which deflected many of the blows. And he was wearing that because of recovering from the carriage accident. But Powell assumed that Seward was dead, and his relatives were pursuing him anyway, so Powell got out of there quickly. On the way, getting out of the house, ended up knifing and pistol whipping a total of five people. So, back to the main part of the story here. Ford's Theater. So Abraham Lincoln and his wife, Mary, they go to Ford's Theater. But it's so weird because there are all these forces, like, telling them, don't go. Don't go to Ford's Theater. Mary Lincoln actually had developed a headache and didn't want to go, but Lincoln told her he had to attend because newspapers had announced that he would. So he talked her into going. Lincoln's footman, William Crook, also advised him not to go, but Lincoln said he had promised his wife... Lincoln told Speaker of the House Schuyler Colfax, quote, I suppose it's time to go, though I would rather stay, before assisting Mary into the carriage. So lots of, like, forces trying to get him not to go. So they arrive at the theater. They were joined by Major Henry Rathbone and his fiancée, Clara Harris, who happened to be the daughter of New York Senator Ira Harris. So the play uh, gets going, and then it stops, actually, in the middle when they realize the president has arrived, and uh, the orchestra plays Hell to the Chief. It's estimated that there's up to 1,700 people that were in the audience, uh, including John Wilkes Booth. Lincoln sat in a rocking chair that had been selected for him among the Ford family's personal furnishings. Of course, on a balcony, you can still see today how it looked back then when you visit Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. All right, so who was guarding Lincoln? Well, originally, uh, it was supposed to be his bodyguard, Ward Hill Lamone, but he was not there that night, and so in his place was assigned policeman, local policeman, John Frederick Parker, 
Parker um, was somebody who was not very reliable. He actually had a pretty shady history and uh, was known as being kind of a corrupt dude. We now know Parker had 14 different disciplinary infractions against him. So Parker was there standing uh, just outside the door of Lincoln, but he couldn't see the show. So he's like, "Uh, I'm leaving. So he went out uh, somewhere else in the auditorium, completely left him. And then at intermission, Parker went to a nearby tavern along with Lincoln's valet, Charles Forbes, and the coachman, Francis Burke. They basically went uh, there to go get drunk, okay? And nobody was left to protect President Abraham Lincoln. A crazy coincidence is that at that same bar was John Wilkes Booth. That's right, likely at the same time, John Wilkes Booth was at the saloon, probably, maybe, sitting next to the dude who was supposed to be guarding Lincoln's life. So there was another customer at the bar who recognized John Wilkes Booth because, of course, he was a celebrity, uh, but he actually didn't ask for his autograph. He was, was talking trash. He said, you'll never be the actor your father was. And Booth supposedly replied, when I leave the stage, I will be the most famous man in America. Well, ominous words indeed, Mr. Booth. So Booth heads out of there shortly thereafter, goes up to the balcony and walks right in where Abraham Lincoln is because there's nobody there guarding the door at all. He knew the play by heart and waited until the actor on stage would say what he thought was the funniest line in the play. And as predicted, the time came and the crowd roared with laughter. At that precise moment, Booth came up behind Lincoln who was also laughing hysterically, and shot him in the head at point-blank range. Mary screamed. Rathbone almost immediately wrestles Booth to the ground, but Booth squirms his way out. After that, he pulls out his knife and stabbed Rathbone in the left arm. Booth next jumped 11 feet off the balcony to the stage below, As he hit the floor, he snapped his fibula bone in his left leg just above his ankle. And it was at this point the audience realized something was wrong. Booth reportedly yelled, Sick Semper Tyrannis, which means thus always to tyrants in Latin. He flashed his knife at the audience and hurried across the stage as quickly as he could. Apparently everything happened so quickly that no one even had time to stop him. They were kind of like just in shock. Booth went out the back door, and he climbed on a horse that had been placed there earlier. Booth rushed out of the city using the Navy Yard Bridge into Maryland. As planned, Booth met up with Harold, and they stopped at Surratt's Tavern to pick up his weapons. At around 4 a.m., Booth and Harold arrived at Dr. Mudd's home, where Mudd set and splinted Booth's broken leg. Meanwhile, back in Washington, Lincoln was unconscious. After examining Lincoln's head wound, Army Surgeon Charles Leal said the president wouldn't survive a carriage ride to the White House, so they carried him across the street to the home of William Peterson. Many doctors were there, and all of them knew there was pretty much nothing they could do. Lincoln never again regained consciousness and died at 7.22 a.m. on April 15, 1865. That morning, more than 2,000 soldiers rode out of D.C. in search of John Wilkes Booth. He now is the most wanted man in America. So one day, he's basically a Hollywood A-list celebrity. The next, he is hated. 11 days later, on April 26th, a group of soldiers and detectives caught up to him at the farm of Richard H. Garrett, a tobacco farmer. Booth and Harold had been sleeping in the barn when the soldiers surrounded it and announced they would set the barn on fire in 15 minutes. Harold surrendered, but Booth refused to come out, reportedly saying, I will not be taken alive. After hearing this, the soldiers set fire to the barn. As the barn went up in flames, Booth stepped out towards the doorway uh, with a gun in each hand. And at that moment, yeah, he got shot. Sergeant Boston Corbett shot Booth, hitting him in the back of the head. 
Corbett did get in trouble uh, for doing that since he disobeyed orders, but later was seen as a hero uh, and even was protected by folks like Secretary of War Edwin Stanton. Later, he apparently went insane after he tried to uh, kill some people. But yeah, uh, Corbett shot John Wilkes Booth, and he died two hours later. The rest of the conspirators were arrested before the end of the month, except John Surratt, who ended up fleeing to Quebec and later Europe. Eventually, though, he was captured in all places Egypt. Eight people were officially charged with the conspiracy to kill not only Abraham Lincoln, but Vice President Andrew Johnson and Secretary of State William Seward. The trial began on May 10th and lasted until June 30th. Lewis Powell was charged with conspiracy and the attempted assassination of Secretary of State William Seward. He was found guilty and sentenced to death. David Harold was charged with conspiracy and aiding Booth's escape. He was also found guilty and sentenced to death. George Adzerat was charged with conspiracy, also guilty, and also sentenced to death. Even though Mary Surratt had very little to do with the conspiracy, other than provide a place for the conspiracy to happen, she was also charged with conspiracy and sentenced to death. The four were hanged on July 7th, 1865, so not that long after the trial. Surratt was the first white woman in history executed by the United States government. Dr. Samuel Mudd was charged with conspiracy and aiding Booth's escape. He was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison, which I think is a little harsh. President Andrew Johnson did pardon him in February 1869, though. Sam Arnold was charged with being part of Booth's earlier plot to kidnap Lincoln. He was found guilty and sentenced to life, but also pardoned by Johnson in 1869. Michael O'Laughlin was charged also with the earlier plot to kidnap Lincoln and sentenced to life in prison. However, he died of yellow fever in prison two years later. Ned Splangler was also charged with helping Booth escape from Ford's Theater immediately after the assassination. He was found guilty and sentenced to six years, but also was pardoned by President Johnson in 1869. Lincoln was the first of four presidents in American history to be assassinated while in office. And today, the Secret Service is in charge of protecting the president. Well, coincidentally, Lincoln had signed the legislation creating the Secret Service the very day he was shot. Today, Abraham Lincoln is considered by most historians to be the greatest American president. And so I know he was controversial during his lifetime, but still, this uh, definitely shocked the nation and really upset, you know, everyone after an already devastating war. And it's just fun to kind of look at this, but if you look at uh, the Kennedy assassination, which is the most recent assassination of an American president. Both presidents were first elected to Congress in a year ending in 46. Both presidents were elected to the presidency in a year ending in 60. Lincoln and Kennedy each have seven letters. Both were particularly concerned with civil rights. Both had wives that had lost a child while living in the White House. Both presidents were shot on a Friday. Both were shot in the head. Both were shot in the presence of their wives. Lincoln's secretary, Kennedy, warned him not to go to the theater. Kennedy's secretary, Lincoln, warned him not to go to Dallas. Those things are, are probably not true. That, that's just pure speculation, by the way. But most of this other stuff is true. Both were assassinated by Southerners. Both were succeeded by Southerners, because Andrew Johnson took over. He's from Tennessee for Lincoln, and Lyndon Johnson from Texas took over for Kennedy. So John Wilkes Booth and Lee Harvey Oswald, and both had... Uh, you know, three names. They were known by three names. Each assassin's name is composed of 15 letters. Booth ran from the theater and was caught in a warehouse. Eh, really, it was a barn, though. Oswald ran from a warehouse and was caught in a theater. Booth and Oswald were assassinated before their trials. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's weird, all those coincidences. It's, it's fun to look at. I think it's a myth, though, to uh, think that it was only John Wilkes Booth. It's important to remember this was a larger conspiracy led by Booth, but other people were involved. So after his death, uh, President Lincoln had a huge funeral. Of course, uh, his body uh, was on a train that went all over the country and ended up back in his hometown of Springfield, Illinois. 
Hundreds of thousands came to say goodbye to their president. Lincoln today is still considered, by most people, the best president the United States has ever had. So there you have it. There is the story of the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. I hope you enjoyed it. My name is Mr. Beat, and this has been Strange Tales in American History. Until next time.